Hey guys, Libby News here. So today I'm going to be doing my review for Tyrant Pet 3 Future Side Episode 5. And honestly, this was probably my favorite episode so far from both sides, but I'll get into that a little bit later. The first thing I want to address in this video is a lot of you guys in my last Future Side video seem sort of confused about the whole Juzo's forbidden action being the punching thing. So a lot of you guys said that in one of the earlier episodes, I think it's the first or the second episode, I'll have to go back and look at it, but it looks as if Juzo punches Ryota in that, but he actually kicks him, and I'll show the pictures or the clip on the screen really slowed down so you guys can see that he actually does kick him, but I just wanted to clear that up. He does kick Ryota, there's no recorded action of him punching anybody, and honestly, I feel like from the past few episodes, the way that the show has really emphasized the fact that he can't punch, even in this episode, he mentions that it's not worth him to use his fist to punch Asahina or something along those lines, so I really do think that it is his forbidden action. Action. But anyways, let's go ahead and move on into the official review. So the opening scene shows Seiko walking away from her house with two dogs who eventually get hit by a motorcycle. Seiko tries to save both of them using her medicine, but only ends up saving one. Then we see Ruruka and Izayoi come up and talk to her, and Ruruka is just so glad that she saved one of the dogs while Seiko is mourning the life of the other one. I think in this episode we really see how much of a heart Seiko has for not only animals, but also for people. She really does want to help others, and we see this with how she tries to save Bandai, how upset she was at Chisa's death in this moment right here when she's saving this puppy, and towards the end of the episode she states that she really wanted to save them all and how guilty she felt about everybody who had died so far in the killing game. So Seiko being this caring, wonderful person obviously is amazing, and a lot of people in the fandom, including myself, have really come to love her character, but it also makes her a very easy target to be taken advantage of, which is exactly what Ruka does. In the next scene, we get an explanation as to why Seiko does not eat Ruka's sweets, and it's because she has a medical condition. The types of medicines that she eats are not compatible with the sweets, so it can actually kill her if she does eat one. And there's a lot more significance relating to that exchange in this episode, which I will talk about later, but something I want to mention before that is a couple of lines, one mentioned in the last Aspiricide episode that seemed to be sort of foretelling, and then another one mentioned in this episode as well. So in the last episode, Ruka said something along the line of how can I trust anyone who does not eat my sweets to Seiko. And I've seen a lot of people speculating online that this could maybe be foreshadowing that she will no longer trust Izioi since he has been rejecting her sweets ever since the game started, which a lot of us believe is probably his forbidden action. And then the line in this episode that's a little bit similar to that in the way that it seems like it's almost foreshadowing something is when Izioi says you can't eat these delicious sweets, I can never live like that. So again, this could possibly be foreshadowing something. There's no, you know, evidence or like proof of it happening, but they do seem a little foreboding. Also in this episode, we see Ruka's perspective on her and Seiko's relationship. And in this, she admits that she was basically using Seiko at first because she would do anything for her. But then Ruka began to feel as if since Seiko was not eating her sweets, she was not acknowledging the only thing that Ruka was good at or knew how to do. And she began to grow bitter about it. I also think there might be some jealousy that Ruka holds for Seiko because later Later in the episode, she states that Seiko was her hero and that she could do anything and would do anything for her. I think she might feel as if her talents are less superior than Seiko's, that Seiko has the ability to save a dying animal, but Ruka's only ability is to make sweets, which Seiko isn't even allowed to acknowledge because of the fact that she takes those medications. Now, I am no way saying that Ruka is in the right in any of this. This whole arc so far has made her look pretty bad. She's come across as being very selfish, but I don't think she's going to be a very two-dimensional character. I think we'll see more of her personality shine, especially after Seiko's death. I think it'll really hit her hard because I think Seiko meant a lot more to her than even maybe she admitted to herself. And we see a little sneak peek of this at the end of the episode when they're fighting together and thinking about their past friendship. So I feel that Ruka really does care for Seiko, but also that she possibly felt second best when comparing their talents because Seiko, like I said, has the ability to save humans, and even more than that, she can make lip balm, she could make things that help you stay awake, things that make you stronger, things that can cure you, and all Ruka could really do was, like I said, make sweets, so I think she definitely had like an inferiority complex that she didn't want to admit to. And with Seiko being unable to fully embrace her talents, I think it made her feel really inferior. Like I said, I am in no way trying to defend Ruka's actions. I think it's ridiculous that she held so much against Seiko because she was unable to eat her 
her sweets, but this is just how I think Ruruka feels about this whole situation. And of course, Seiko's side to the story is just so sad. We really got a good look at her character and how she feels and how she works. She really did just want a friend that she could love and trust, and I really felt for her this episode. I really grew to like her uh, from last episode as well, and I saw a lot of people sort of speculating that she might be the next to die, which of course is confirmed in this episode, which is very sad that she died, but I was happy that she got a lot of development and a lot of screen time before her death on like Bandai and Gozu. And I do feel like we'll see her more in the despair side as well as it's mentioned in the episode that Munakata helped her once she was expelled from Hope Speak Academy, so we might actually end up seeing her in the next episode of despair side. But moving on from this, I want to talk about a couple of other things before I talk about Seiko's final scene at the end of the episode. It also Munakata and Tengen's conversation, which was very, very important, I mind you. But one of the other important things I wanted to talk about was Izioi when he's in the library sort of room. He runs into a secret entrance after picking up this gun slash knife combo. The entrance says, congratulations, you found the secret entrance. So at this point, nobody knows what this could lead towards. I think the most obvious assumption right now could be maybe where Monica is or where the mastermind or the traitor or the attacker likes to hide. But my whole idea about this door is that I feel like that it's something that Monica or the mastermind or somebody else involved in this killing game set up in order to manipulate the player's actions. So the fact to me that it says, congratulations, you found a secret doorway, sort of implies to me that the person that set it up wanted a player to find it and enter it. So back in the previous games, a lot of the times we saw that Jinko would set up things and that she knew what character was going to do what based off of what she'd provided for them. So she was able to manipulate people's actions by understanding and knowing each person's personality and then find ways to manipulate them based off of that, even if it didn't even involve her speaking to them. So I think this door is probably a similar sort of thing, just a way for the mastermind and Monica and anybody else involved to try and manipulate the group. As for what's behind it, I have no idea, <laughs> but I'm sure whatever it is, it falls somehow into the mastermind's plan. We also get to see more of Monica this episode. It seems that she got Mio working again, and we see that she is still as sadistic as always. But I was really happy that we got to see her again, even if it was just this quick little clip. So next, I want to move into the next really big area of this episode, which is the whole conversation between Munakata and Tengen, and there was a lot of stuff implied in this and revealed and it was really really crazy. So firstly Minakata talks to Tengen about how he looked up to him and how he believes that Tengen is a coward now and he asks Tengen why he stopped doing things the way that he used to and Tengen replies because I learned that the way we're doing things now will not eliminate despair. And then Tengen accuses him of sacrificing Yukazome which of course puts Munakata back on edge. And in the previous episode it seemed like when Tengen mentioned Yukazome being a sacrifice it was as if she was a casualty to Munakata's type of hope that he endorses. But now it seems as if he's literally accusing Munakata of being the traitor based off of the stuff that we saw at the end of the episode, but I'll get to that in a little bit. But then Tengen says to Munakata, you think that killing all the despairs will create hope, but it won't. Then he states that's why they began the Izuru Kamakura project, which we see in the despair side Tengen and Kizakura are both against. So my first idea with this is that when Munakata brings up the Kamakura project, Tengen says, and yes, there's that. It sort of makes it sound as if there was an other project that Tengen was referring to as well, so I'm interested to see what that's all about. And as I said before, Tengen and Kizakura were both against the Izuru Kamakura project, so the fact that he says he couldn't let that go to waste is pretty odd. But after this, Munakata accuses Tengen of being the attacker and a remnant of despair. When Munakata asks Tengen why a great man like him would become a remnant of despair, Tengen states that he is not a remnant, which we all know to be true because Tengen's forbidden action is that he cannot actually lie when he's asked a question. Then Munakata asks that if he is that certain, then he must know the attacker's identity. Tengen answers, and of course we don't actually get to hear the answer, but we do see his lips moving. So I saw this post online, and it's by the Tumblr user FreakySandra1995, and as always, I'll link the blog in the original post in the description if you guys want to check it out. But basically, they state that the popular opinion of fans in Japan is that he says that the attacker alternates based off of the way he moves his lips in this. So I thought I'd just point that out to you guys. It is animation, so it's kind of hard to point out 
what he's saying, but that's the most popular theory I've seen from the Japanese speaking community so far. But after this, Munakado sort of loses it a little bit and says, did you think that would suffice to make me waver? And then him and Tengen attack each other and he ends up killing Tengen and Tengen stabs him in the eye. After this, he states, you know nothing, not about me or my plan. And then Tengen's last words are, hope, where do you suppose you will find the answer? And then we see Seiko's last moments. She looks at a bottle of a medicine called Cure W and thinks about how she wishes she could have saved everybody who had died so far. And right before the bracelet goes off and she falls asleep, she looks at a piece of candy that Ruka had given her when they first met, really showing how much she cared about their friendship even after they had started the feud. And then we of course see that she is the next person killed by the attacker and she is mounted into a wall rather severely. So it's implied that the person that killed her had a lot of power and also she is stabbed in the heart like every other victim and hung up as well. I think we are seeing a pattern in the attacker hanging up every victim. I'm not completely sure what it means, but I feel like it probably will play a significant role later down the line. And previously in the episode, Kirigiri mentions when she's observing the bodies that she feels as if after she looks at Great Gozu, she'll be able to figure out the killer's methods. So I think we'll learn more about why they've decided to kill the victims in the same way every time, if it's the same person, if it's different people, and things like that from her investigation. As for how somebody could have pushed her into the wall like this, I was thinking at first it would either have to be somebody who has really good power, or if she had some of those pills left over that she used to become stronger, maybe they stole those from her before they killed her. And speaking of stolen medicine, after the credits we see Munakata has actually taken the cure potion in order to heal his own wounds. Then we see him open his eyes and state, now time to end this. And the discussion about his eyes has been pretty big, so something that I was thinking about is whenever Seiko would take a lot of pills, her eyes would change. So like I was saying before, with Seiko's body, somebody would need to have a lot of power in order to prop her up like that. So either they have a lot of power naturally, or maybe they stole her pills in order to gain power to do this. And since Munakata's eyes do look odd, kind of how Seiko's eyes looked odd when she would overdose on medicine, it does make him look suspicious to me. Especially since we see him with a bottle that looks like the Cure W potion as well that Seiko was holding before she died. And I'm sort of suspicious of him now again of killing Chisa as well because of what Tengen had said previously in the episode and Munakata's reactions to it. But honestly, I'm not sure. I mean, based off this episode, he definitely looks suspicious or like he's involved in this somehow. But this whole episode was really vague in describing a lot of big plot points. So I definitely think there's a lot more to this than we've seen in this episode and I'm really looking forward to it. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this review. I loved this episode. This was honestly, honestly my favorite episode of both sides so far. And I think it's just gonna Gonna keep getting better from here. I do hope that the despair side will start to really kick into gear soon as well because we've gotten a lot of funny stuff from it but it hasn't really gotten into the despair at all so I'm really hoping that they'll do that next episode. As for the next future side episode, I really think Munakata is just gonna tear things up and we're gonna learn a lot more about everything that's going on. But I really hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you did it would be awesome if you left a like or a comment. It really helps me out so I will see you guys real soon. Subscribe to Weeby News for more hope-filled videos.